Okay, let's crank it up because the first thing I'm going to do here is give you a test bag. So I mentioned earlier, um, the grades are posted to the website, right? And your website, um, my, what do they call it there? My total. Yeah, your website, my total has been updated. All right. So I think the total you're seeing there is your current grade, right? Through this test and then whatever homeworks that have been due up until now. So you know what you're thinking at this point. Okay. So for many of you, that is uh, really high, I think. So that's great. All right. So um, you want to keep up the good work. Uh, and if you're not where you want to be, right, well, then um, I think the I think the test was probably a good clue as to what you might have to do differently, right? Um, uh, because, you know, the test, uh, again, <laughs> resembles the sample test. <laughs> There's really no better way for preparing for the exams than um, diligently working on the sample test, okay? In addition to your homeworks, of course, right? Um, because those prepare you for sample tests too, right? But the sample test really gives you an idea of how the test is going to look and what sort of problems you're going to test. Well, um, let me let me give you your actual papers back. So um, Do <laughs> Who else came in? Didn't get one. Okay. Oh, I think I have one for everybody when they show up. Uh, all right, so the um uh, there's really no reason to review this, but the um, because the uh, answers are posted, all right. So uh, on the um, Blackboard page, all right, in the test answers folder. So um, you can look at the um, if you don't recognize uh, uh, if if you miss points, if you don't recognize what you know what you did wrong, then um, uh, of course take a look at the test answers, right. But I would encourage you to uh, on your own before you look at that because this is always the case. So before you look at the solutions, uh, 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 look and see if you can correct the mistake uh, that you made, right? Before you uh, look at the answers. In many cases, um, you'll recognize immediately, right? Uh, you already had a feeling of what, uh, uh, you know, you want to die. So when you were working on the problem, so you'll recognize it. That wrong. Um, uh, so so uh, try correcting yourself first before uh, you look at the uh, uh, before you look at the answer key.
Um, okay. Now, also, the uh, flux dollars have been, you notice there's a little line there now. It's been added, uh, calculus flux. I don't know why the asterisk is there, but uh, uh, but that, uh, but your flux total has been updated. So if you go, so that doesn't count into your overall average, but if you go to my total, there may be a faster way of getting to this. This is not but how I know. So if you go to my total and then scroll down here to raw scores, uh, it will show you what your calculus flux total is. Ignore the the average and 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 um, the, you just want to look at what what points are there, right there. So of course I don't have any right. So but but um, depending on your score on the test, you may have some added in there, right? Um, and of course that's where the uh, uh, the the uh, bonus for not violating the the um, um, attendance policy will go eventually, right? And calculus flux for having a high homework average and all those things that get added into that uh, at the end of the uh, at the end of the semester. Okay, um, I think the most you could have now is uh, fifteen if you scored um, uh, high on this test. Right, many of you did, so uh, you should have that there. How do I get out of this now? Okay, all right. So. Um... <laughs> Okay. Um don't let me forget the, uh, do not let me forget the uh, roll sheet, right? Uh, again. Um, so there is a homework due this evening, right? Um, and uh, I think uh, I added some new homeworks there. Uh, we're going to talk about these topics uh, starting today, but we still have a few pesky examples uh, to go over <laughs> with lines and planes in space. There's a, <laughs> such a big variety of problems that, we, <laughs> that come up with uh, on, on this topic. And um, so there were a couple of things that we didn't do examples of uh, before the test that I that I want to do now that are on this homework. OK. Um, but uh, uh, one thing uh, you you actually could have done. Uh, 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 bef but I, 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 I told you to skip this problem uh, 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 is the um, before the test uh, is the last problem here from. Um, the last problem here from this homework, and it's, you know, it's just a geometry problem. It's kind of given as a stated problem, but it's really just a geometry problem here. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, look at this one just to remind you um, uh, a couple of facts there that we'd already learned uh, uh, before the test. And I think uh, there was a problem uh, related to this on the test, but not but not stated problem, watch this one. So in this problem, it says that you have to shoot, right, that uh, uh, some material is falling. And, uh, oh, it's great, right? Uh, so the shoot at the top of a grain elevator. Uh, and um, uh, so grain is falling through that shoot, right? And uh, so what they want to know is, so there's the shape of the shoot. And what they want to know is what is the angle between the sides of the shoot, okay? So what's the angle? between these, uh, you know, these flat sides, right, of this, uh, of this shoot. But the shoot is not quite um, a, a, a square or rectangular, right, okay? Because it's a shoot, so it's, it's funneling down. So the bottom here is a six by six square, but at the top of the shoot, that's a by eight square at the top, right, okay? But these are still... Uh, flat surfaces, the uh, sides of the uh, uh, sides there of the uh, of shoot. So what they want to know is again, what's the angle between the sides? So intuitively, um, it's and it's really hard to um, uh, break your intuition about this. Okay, um, intuitively you're thinking that angle's got to be ninety degrees. Okay, so indeed, if this were if this were um, you know, a box shape shoot, right? Okay, the, the angle between the sides would be 90 degrees. But because the top, it's, um, 
uh, uh, bigger than the bottom, right? That that changes things a little bit geometrically. Okay, it's still hard to imagine. Still, uh, uh, your intuition is strongly telling you the angle between the sides is ninety degrees. Uh, uh, but uh, but we're going to calculate it exactly, and see, it doesn't turn out to be exactly ninety. Degrees, okay, um, because of the shape of the uh, because of the shape of the shoe, right? So what this problem really is, of course, is just. What's the angle between two planes, right? Okay. Because the sides here of the shoe are really just flat surface planes, right? Uh, in three dimensions. So we're just trying to find the angle between two planes. That's, that's uh, uh, the calculus three uh, version of the problem, right? Not the, not the grain elevator version of the, not the grain elevator version of the problem. So um, let's skip here uh, to some notes. And I just copied this picture right um, so what you really want to do here is just superimpose a 3d set of axes on this picture right um and then um uh, once you've got that 3d set of axes superimposed on the picture then um um uh, 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 you can uh, locate points there uh, on the 3d set of axes that uh, uh, that correspond to kind of i think are the vertices of the top and the bottom of the shoe, right? Okay, and then you can write down vectors, right? And uh, uh, that are that lay in these uh, lay, lay these sort of plain sides, right? Of the shoe, and uh, this is a capital three problem. So, uh, so let's do that. Let me see if I can. Let me see if I can draw this in here. How how we can superimpose a set of axes. So, you know, my, uh, but this is not the way the solution in the book went, but this is how I'm going to do it. So let's think of this right here, the bottom of the chute there as sitting right there adjacent to uh, uh, the x-axis. So let's make this the x-axis, all right? And then um, um, let's make, uh, uh, coming back here along this back edge of the chute, Let's make that the, the y-axis, right? So we've got that that corner of the shoot is sitting right at the origin, right of the uh, right at the origin of the x and the y uh, axis, right? So I'm gonna put a y-axis here, and then uh, of course going up, right? Um, Uh, of course, is as usual, right? Is the uh, is the z axis. But keep in mind, right? The shoot is is widening at the top, right? So uh, when you draw the z axis up, it, it, it of course is not going to go along the side of this shoot, right? Okay, uh, the z axis is going to be going straight up, right? Perpendicular to uh, the x y plane. Let's see. How do y'all want to? Um, how do y'all want to put the tick marks here? I guess we would make this what the positive side of the the positive side of the x axis. Let me just write a plus here to indicate that. So this would be the positive side of the x-axis. And uh, let's make this the also, but but of course you can do it differently. Let's make this also the positive side of the, let's make this also the positive side of the y-axis as well. And of course this is gonna be, uh, going up will be the positive side of the z-axis. So with that in mind, uh, let's try to locate some points on these sides, okay, uh, that we're thinking of as planes. So obviously, th this front side, right? Um, what are so, uh, you know? What are sort of the points that are that are on the corners of this front side? Obviously, this point, right? Um, that's the origin, correct? Okay, and um, this point's pretty easy to. Uh, this point's pretty easy also to uh, write down coordinates for that, right? Uh, because that obviously has to be what, six, zero, zero? So that point's pretty easy to um, uh, to locate. But now this is where things get harder. So let's see if we, what is that point though, okay? So where's that point? Uh, where's that point located there? Well, I think I, I, think I know the, I think I know the Z coordinate, right? <laughs> so that's got to be eight, correct? Because this shoot is eight inches tall. So I can fill in the eight, but the X and Y are the ones you have to think about, right? Um, because again, this shoot is not 
uh, is not a box, right? Okay. So um, where is that point located with respect to the X and the, the Y axis? Uh, oh, oh, I see. Oh, this is, uh, 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 is it negative two, negative? Is that right? Because this thing is eight inches, right? So this is, uh, I don't think so, but you're close, Elijah. All right. So you're right. This length is eight inches, right? And and uh, 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 I'll, I'll, and this bottom side here, it's you know, that's along the y axis, is six inches. So the top is eight. The bottom is six. So how much is this thing sticking out, sort of forward? Yeah, it'd be negative one, negative one, right? This thing is coming forward like one inch, right? Uh, because in the back, it's also going back for an inch because that top uh, side is eight inches long, right? You got to get that right. So it's uh, the top side is two inches longer than the bottom side, one inch in the front, longer an inch in the back. Longer. Okay. So you're right, uh, Elijah. Uh, the x coordinate here is minus one. All right. Okay. And the y coordinate also is uh, minus one. We could locate this point as well. Uh, I, maybe we need that, okay? Um, uh, 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 maybe we need that, but um, uh, uh, but we, let's fill that in when we need it, right? Because, uh, so on this front plane, right, we've already got, um, on this front plane, we've already got three points. That means that we can write down two vectors that are in the, we can write down two vectors that are in the plane, right? Uh, in this front side, correct? The vector going, from this point to this point, correct? And then, of course, the vector going from uh, uh, this point uh, uh, on the bottom uh, uh, to this point, six, zero, zero, right? Okay. So, um, uh, how do you want to label those two? Uh, how do you want to label those two le vectors? Let's call one of them U1. Let's call this one, uh, uh, this vector from uh, the origin to this point, six, zero, zero. Let's call it U1. So, what is that vector? Yeah, it's six zero zero, right? So it's uh, essentially six i, correct? And um, uh, uh, let's call here uh, a v one this vector that runs along this side, right? So that's also easy to uh, 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 calculate, right? Because it's coming from the origin. So that would be what minus i minus j plus eight k, right? Okay. And now, how do you, then? How do you find the the normal vector for that front side? So we'll call that n one. So the normal vector for the front side. Remember, that's the vector perpendicular to the front side. Yeah, you take the cross product, right? So let n one be u one cross v one. You get that cross product. Now we need to uh, uh, pick uh, uh, an adjacent side, okay? I don't want to use the back side because those the front side and back side don't eat right. Okay. But let's pick one of the adjacent sides because we want the angle. Let's try this side. Okay. And I need um, I need two points on that side. Let's see. What about this point? That one seems like that should be kind of a sitting duck, right? What should be the coordinates of that point? Yeah, I think it's six on the x-axis, right? And isn't it six on the y-axis as well, right? And zero on the the x-axis, okay? And what other point do y'all want to use there? You got two other choices. So you want to try this one in the back, or let's try this one in the front. Maybe that one's easier. So, hmm, what are the coordinates of that point? Well, and again, the, the Z chord is easy, right? That's eight, correct? And then what about the X and the Y chord? What about the X coordinate? Not six, because remember, we're not going straight up, right? What? Seven, right? One more, right? Okay. Then go out one from six, right? Back one from zero, right? To get the, uh, get the top side. And then what's the uh, Y chord? Is that minus one? 
again. Because remember, this is coming forward a little bit, right? So that would be minus one. So what's our so what's our vectors for that uh, for this plane, right? Uh, vectors that fall into this plane, the plane that's the the right hand side of that uh, uh, the right hand side of that funnel. Let's see what about let's call um, let's call u one this vector that runs along this edge. So what's that vector? Is that six j? Yes, six j, right? Okay, you're not going up, so the uh, the k uh, uh, the z component is zero, right? Uh, you're not going. Uh, you're going back, right? In the positive direction, six, and you're not going left and right, right? You're moving from this point to this point. So, this vectors uh, in standard form is six j, and then what about this vector? So running up that um, running up that side. We didn't find that one a minute ago, right? But now we can. So let's see, what's its um, what's the first component to right? You're going six to seven, so that's just I, right? And then along the uh, along the y-axis, you're going minus one, right? So you're gonna have minus j. And then along the z-axis, you're going up k, up eight, right? So you'll have eight k. So there are two vectors that are on this side. And now again, form their cross product so you can get the normal vector for the right-hand side. So take uh, u2 cross v2, and that gives you the normal vector for the right-hand side. Now, I'm not going to compute the two normal vectors, right? So I'm not going to calculate those. But once, or that's easy, right? You just do those cross products, okay? But once you found those normal vectors, then you're in business, right? Because you know the angle between the normal vectors is going to be the same as the angle between these two planes, all right? So you just have to find the angle between those two vectors. And what's the formula for that? Well, you have to you have to do it a little bit uh, backwards, right? But you know what the cosine of the angle between those two vectors isn't it? What the um, isn't it the dot product of the two vectors, right? Divided by their magnitudes, the product of their magnitudes. Did y'all forget that already from the test? So, yeah, okay. So uh, uh, calculate that uh, that uh, quotient, right? And um, and then use our cosine, and that will give you the, uh, these two planes, the same as the angle between those two sides. It does not come out to be um, it does not come out to be ninety degrees. It comes out to be almost ninety degrees, but not quite. It's like eighty nine degrees, so it's very close, but not quite uh, ninety degrees. So when you uh, uh, when you actually do those calculations for that problem, um, <laughs> you're going to come out with something like 89.1, I think something like that. I don't know if that's exactly the decimal place, but something close to that. Uh, so th that should be what you expect um, uh, for the answer. Um, okay, so now there are other problems on this homework that we also skipped for the test. And I think all of those problems involve um, uh, 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 finding either the, uh, the line where two planes intersect or the distance from a point, the, the shortest distance from a point to a line in space. So on the test, we had a problem about finding the distance from a point to a plane in space, but, uh, 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 but there are other uh, instances where we can compute the distance from a point to a, a, just a straight line in space, right? Um, so let me show you how to do those things, right? So you can finish your, uh, so you can finish this homework uh, for this evening. So there were a, there are a couple of examples like this in the notes, but we didn't um, we didn't do those. And they're conceptually very easy to understand. All right. So we've already we already looked at this diagram before when we were trying to find the angle between two planes, just like we did in that, um, just like we were doing in that homework problem uh, uh, just now. Okay, so remember, 
if you have two planes, right, if you're given two planes and you want to find the angle between the two planes, that's the same as the angle between the two normal vectors for the planes. So you find the, the perpendicular vectors for the planes, right, the normal vectors for the planes, and you can compute the, um, you can compute the uh, angle between them, and that gives you also the angle between the two planes. Now, uh, if two planes are not parallel, though, remember, they're going to intersect one another in a straight line, okay? So, of course, parallel planes do not intersect, right? But uh, uh, any two non-parallel uh, parallel planes will intersect, and they'll intersect in a straight line. And so uh, uh, sometimes we're interested in finding what is the uh, 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 what are the equations for that straight line where two planes um, intersect, okay? And um, what this picture illustrates is that um, uh, 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 for this uh, a line where two planes intersect, the direction vector for the line is going to be parallel to the cross product of the normal vectors for the two planes. Okay, remember if you have two um, if you have two vectors, right, and you take their cross product. Remember their cross product is perpendicular to both of the vectors. So that's why in this picture, right, where I've got these two. Uh, vectors in one and in two, when I computed their cross product, it's perpendicular to both in one and in two, right? That's one of the purposes of creating cross products is to find perpendicular uh, vectors like this one. Well, it turns out, and you can, the, the picture sort of illustrates it, it turns out that this, uh, this cross product will be parallel to the line of intersection of the two planes. So that means you can use the cross product as the direction vector for the line, right? Okay, so that's the key insight. All right. Um, if you want to find the line where two planes intersect, okay, if you take the cross product of the normal vectors for the two planes, you can use that cross product as the direction vector for the line. And of course, once you've got the direction direction vector for the line, then you're home free, right? You can easily write down the uh, uh, the equations for the line, either in parametric form or in symmetric form. Um, uh, but you do need to know one other piece of information. In addition to knowing the direction vector for a line, you also need to know what other piece of information about the line to write down the equations for the line. So if you wanna write down the equations for a line, you have to know its direction vector, but what else do you have to know about the line? A point, yeah, you have to have a point on the line, right? Okay, so um, uh, so if you have a point on the line and the direction vector for the line, then you can write down the equations for the line. All right, let's try this then uh, in an example. So I don't have a picture of this example, unfortunately. Do I? No. Okay. I wish I did, but I don't. All right. So um, there we have the equation for two uh, 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 equations for two planes, right? Um, this is the equation for a plane because it's just a first degree equation, right? With three unknowns, X, Y, and Z. So that's the, uh, when you graph that, you're gonna get a plane. And uh, likewise here, this is, a this is a first degree equation in three unknowns, X, Y, and Z. So when you graph this, you're also gonna get a plane. And I don't think these two planes are parallel. We'll check that in just a moment, okay? But I don't think these two planes are parallel. And if they're not parallel, then that means they have to intersect each other and they'll intersect each other in a line. So we want to find the, parametr uh, the parametric equations for the line where those two planes intersect, okay? So, uh, so remember what the process is. I need to know what about the two planes. The two planes, yeah. They're, they're normal vectors, right, okay? So I need to know they're normal vectors, but that's almost trivial, right, isn't it, Elijah? Because once you've got the equation for the uh, plane and it's been simplified like this, okay, right, then you can just uh, uh, read off the normal vector very simply, right? What's the normal vector for this plane? Yeah, so you get to what, 2i minus 4j plus 3k, right? Uh, if we write it in standard form. So see, that's so simple. That's just the coefficients, right, uh, of the unknowns. 
And for the second plane, we'll call its normal vector n sub two. So what is its, um, what's that normal vector n sub two in standard form? Plus k, right, yeah, there you go, right, okay. And now what you know is the direction vector for the line where these two things intersect each other is going to be the cross product of these two vectors, right? Or you can use that cross product as a direction vector for the line, okay? Um, uh, we should check to make sure that these two uh, planes are not parallel to each other. So uh, to check that, just make sure make sure the two normal vectors are not parallel. And remember, vectors are going to be parallel. How can you check parallel vectors? What now? Yeah, to see if one is a scalar multiple of the other, right? So I don't think that's true, right? Because uh, to make N1 a scalar multiple of N2, well, uh, uh, notice you would have to multiply the I times 2, right? But if you multiply the I times 2, for instance, you get 2K, not 3K, right? So um, so these are not multiple, uh, scalar multiples of one another. So they're not parallel planes. What's the other way of checking? What's the harder way of checking? If um, Is it the dot product or is it the... Uh, yeah, when the cross product equals zero. <laughs> so we're getting ready to compute the cross product anyway. So I guess we could have waited until we calculated the cross product here. Uh, but that's a lot of work. So, um, uh, so uh, they're not they're not parallel. All right. Um, now, so let's compute that cross product quickly here. You know, we're pretty good at well, actually, not pretty good. I sh I'm not being fair. You were very good at computing cross products uh, on the test. Um, uh, but but cross products are prone to arithmetic mistakes, and in a few cases, you made arithmetic mistakes. I think. Maybe sometimes you were hurrying there, all right? So the cross product here, D, is going to be, let's see, what's that first coefficient going to be? So sort of ignore that first column, right? And um, is that right? Ignore the first column? And then um, compute the cross product there with the second two columns, what? So you get, what, minus 4, minus 6, is that right? Ooh, man, I made a mess there. I get for laying my 10 on there. So um, minus 10i, did I start that right? Minus four, minus six. And then for the middle term, right, you would get what? Two minus three. So that's negative j, but you have to change the sign. So that's going to be plus j, right? And then um, uh, for the last term, right, ignore the third column. So we get four minus a minus four, so that would be four plus four, which is eight, so 8K, I think. Which is not zero. So again, that tells us that these two um, uh, uh, planes are not parallel to each other, all right? But we can use this vector now as the direction vector for the line of intersection. So now we know the direction vector for the line of intersection and uh, now, what, what's next here is really kind of the hard part of the problem, in a way. <laughs> what do we have to find next? Yeah, we have to find a point. So that means we have to find values for x, y, and z that satisfy both of these equations simultaneously. Okay, So we have to find a simultaneous solution to these two linear equations. Uh, that's a, that's a, uh, 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 there's a whole subject, uh, uh, a whole branch of mathematics dev uh, uh, devoted to this, this very problem. That's called linear algebra. All right. So we want to find a simultaneous solution to, um, uh, 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 to these two um, equations. And um, so th there's a, there's a lots of ways that you can go about this. Um, uh, 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 sometimes just guessing or, or just the, uh, uh, lo looking and observing uh, uh, will lead you to a solution. Another thing you can do is, um, if you want to be more formal about it, is um, uh, take one of the equations and solve it for one of the variables, right? Uh, wh whatever is convenient. So this second equation is very easy to solve for x, right? Because all you've got to do is shift the these two terms to the right-hand side. So you would get from that second equation, you would get x is equal to 1 is it minus 2y minus z, right? 
And now you can substitute that for x in the first equation. So you get 2 times 1 minus 2y minus z. Don't let me make a sign mistake here. Uh, minus 4y plus 3z is equal to 2. Let's simplify this. So we have 2 minus 4y minus 2z minus 4y plus 3z uh, is equal to 2. So if you add like terms together, it looks like you're going to get what? Minus 8y plus, is it positive z? Oh, nice. Okay. Um, is equal to, let's move the constants. And um, oh, what are the constants going to be? Zero? Is that right? Oh. And now you're just looking for um, now you're just looking for a simultaneous solution. Uh, now you're just looking for some, not even simultaneous because you've got one equation. Now you're just looking for uh, solutions to this equation, right? Okay, but that's just an equation with two unknowns. That's just a linear equation. So you can easily generate solutions here just by choosing a value for one of the unknowns and solving for the other one, right? Okay, uh, but in this case, it's particularly simple because... Um, uh, uh, what can you immediately see would be solu uh, solutions for y and z to this equation? Zero, right? If y is zero, z is also zero, right? Okay. And so, um, uh, so, uh, so, see, so you're in business there, right? So, as part of our simultaneous solution, we know as part of our simultaneous solution to the original set of equations, we know what if um, if uh, y is equal to zero, then uh, we can uh, let z also be zero. But if that's the case, that means x is equal to what? So you can plug both of those back in here and get x is what? One. Ah, well, that one we could probably could have found that by just... So there is a simultaneous solution uh, to our uh, 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 set of equations there. Oh, we could have seen that by observation, right? Uh, C, obvious, right? X is one, here's the second, Y and Z have, right? That also works in the first group. X is Y and Z, it's in time, two. So um, this, this, uh, this point we might have been able to easily see uh, is on the, um, is, is on the line. It's on the intersection of the two equations. So there's our point, one, zero, zero, Right, that is on both of these planes, so that means it's on that line where the two planes intersect, correct? And um, so it's on our line with direction vector uh, minus 10i plus j plus 8k, right? So that means uh, what's the parametric, um, what's the parametric equations for our um, line then? X is going to be what? How do we get this? Take this, right? And then use this coefficient, right? To form first parametric equation. And then what's the next one? Zero plus T, right? One times T. And then the third one is zero again, right? Uh, plus eight times T. Ah, so, yay, there it is. So there's the line of intersection uh, between those two. There's the line section between those two planes, right? Um, if this hadn't worked out to be so nicely to be 8y plus z is equal to zero, it would have been just as easy, right? Plug in any value. Once you got to this equation, plug in any number you want for y or z and solve for the other variable, right? This is just a linear equation in two variables, right? Okay. So, you generate solutions to this linear equation just like you uh, would uh, if you're graphing a line uh, in two dimensions, right? Um, okay, so that's how you find, uh, what were you doing there? Oh, find the intersection of two planes, okay? Uh, that's how you do it. The other problem that, um, that we skipped, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time explaining the, uh, uh, this uh, formula, but um, uh, but here it is, okay? Um, if you want to find the distance from a point uh, to a line, right? 
So, uh, so we know how to find, uh, or we practiced on the test, how to find the distance from a point to a plane, okay? But if you want to point to a straight line, here's the, here's the formula. Uh, for this, uh, by the way, what was the what was the? Do you recall the formula now for um, the distance from a point to a plane? It was something like this. Of of the normal vector, and then you divided that by what the of the normal vector. Was it the magnitude of the normal vector, like this? Ah, so notice that uh, these two formulas are uh, they're uh, very similar to each other. Okay, um, if you want to find uh, 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 from a given point Q to a line in space, okay, then you find the cross product of the vector from. Um, uh, 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 a point on the line to your given point Q, all right? And then this is the direction vector for the line, okay? So you take the cross product of these two vectors, but of course that's gonna be a vector. When you take the cross product of two vectors, you get a vector. So you have to compute the magnitude of that. And then you divide it by the magnitude of the direction vector for the line, okay? So remember, uh, um, Q here is the point you're given you want to find the distance from that point to a given line, right? So Q is a point off of the line and P is some point on the line, okay? Any point on the line will do that, right? So compute the vector between any point on the line and your given point that's off the line, right? Find that vector, take the cross product of that with the direction vector for the line, right? Compute the magnitude of that cross product and divide it by the magnitude of the direction vector. And that will give you the distance from the point to straight line okay so these two formulas look the same right so they're easy kind of to remember uh, if you can distinguish uh, one from the other let's quickly apply that so um we don't spend all of our time on these uh, distance problems uh, the calculations are sometimes a little bit tedious right uh, 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 um Let's see. So we want to find that again. I don't have a picture of this. It's like a picture, but we can imagine it. Uh, uh, so we want to find the distance. This point Q, P minus one, four, and this line. Now you do want to make sure that your point. Uh, you want to make sure, right, that your point's not on the line, okay? Because well, I guess if it's on the line, you'll end up with a distance of zero. I'm not sure what happens if you try applying it. So. This is between this point Q and this line, and there are the parametric equations for um, there are the parametric equations for the line, right? So to apply that formula, you need to know the direction vector for the line. I'm going to call it D instead of U. In the formula, they call it U. I don't know why, but uh, let's call it D there. What is the direction vector for this line? So you've got the parametric equations. So it's easy to read off the direction vector, right? What's the direction vector here? Minus 2j plus 4k, right? There you go. Okay. And then we need a point on the line in the formulas they call that p. But that's easy to generate also from the parametric equations. Uh, parametric equations make it easy to generate the point. What's the point on um the line yeah we can use negative two zero and one correct remember this is the same as zero minus two t but you can get any other point you want off the line by choosing different values for t here and plugging into these three equations right uh, you get this point by choosing t equals zero uh which is um of course very convenient right but you could choose t to be one or two or minus one or minus two and get other points right on the uh, other points on the uh, other points on the line, and then we have to compute the vector PQ, right? So uh, the vector from this point to our given point Q. So that looks like what five uh, i um, minus j plus three k. Am I doing that right? 
So you would have three minus a minus two, right? For the first component of the vector, that would be five I minus one minus zero for the second component of the vector, that's minus J and then four minus one for the third component of the vector. And then the rest of this now just becomes arithmetic, okay? So to find this distance, right, you're going to have to find this. To find this distance, you're going to have to find, right, the cross product of these vectors. Compute its magnitude and then divide that by the magnitude of um, direction vector. Okay, so I'm not going to work through the end of this example. I think y'all can do these cross products and uh, these magnitudes uh, easily, right? Uh, but there's the uh, there's the setup. I'll finish it before I post the notes. If you're curious about what what the final choice is here, okay? Um, all right. Whew. Okay. So at last, we're through talking about. Uh, lines and planes, but we're not through talking about uh, uh, surfaces, okay, like planes, uh, because those are going to be, um, uh, you know, just really crucial to the, uh, 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 to the class, right? Um, but we want to branch out a little bit and, um, and get a catalog uh, of, uh, of uh, or develop uh, knowledge of surfaces, uh, uh, a catalog of surfaces, um, besides just planes, okay? So, you know, planes are useful, but they're they're boring, right? Because they're just, just a plane, right? So we want to think about surfaces that are a little bit more exotic uh, in uh, in three dimensional space than just uh, uh, than just planes. So that's what we're going to do right now is just talk about certain types of surfaces um, uh, in three-dimensional space, okay? But there's an infinite variety of surfaces in three-dimensional space, right? So we're just going to talk about some of the more famous ones. Uh, and um, let me pass out for you uh, a little cheat sheet. Or I should not pass out the sheet. Um, a little cheat sheet. Um, it's kind of a library. So... Certain so, uh, quadratic space, so, so, space. This is just a page from the book, but this is handy as a reference, okay? Because, um, You know, surfaces in three uh, three dimensional space are complex, right? And they're really impossible to graph by hand. Um, uh, 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 and, uh, and and you, and but when you're uh, dealing with a surface in three dimensional space, uh, it's good to have an at least some inkling of if you if you were to graph the surface, what it would look like. Okay. Uh, at least a vague idea of if you were to graph the surface, what sort of picture you would get, okay? Uh, not that we're going to be graphing surfaces other than planes by hand, okay? But uh, even if we use software to graph surfaces, we want to be able to understand when we look at the image generated by the software, is that kind of what we were expecting to see? Or is that not what we were expecting to see uh, when we constructed the graph? Um, okay, so we've already talked about planes, right? So you know that, uh, it, it, of course, if you have an equation in three variable, and it's a first degree equation in three variable, right? So all the unknowns there are just are, right? Then, of course, we've got that here. So we're all uh, uh, about planes now, okay? But of course, there's a big variety of surfaces in three dimensions. And... Um, Let's talk about one that I kind of mentioned last time. So this doesn't appear on this cheat sheet yet. Okay, uh, we haven't come to that yet. All right. Um, let's talk about a surface that's called a cylinder. Right. 
So this is also a very common surface that uh, uh, that occurs, a common type of surface that occurs in um, three-dimensional space. Right? Now, in a cylinder, when you have an equation in uh, 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 three unknowns, x, y, and z, but where one of the unknowns is missing from the equation, right? One of the unknowns is missing from the equation. So suppose you were uh, dealing with this equation, x squared plus y squared plus not, right? Okay. Now, uh, uh, if, if you were just uh, thinking in the context of tension, that would just be an equation in two variables, right? Okay. And so graph that you get some sort of curve, right? right? But if you're in the context of three dimensions, so if you're working in that context, then when you look at this equation, you want to think of it as that's an equation in three unknowns, but one of the unknowns, namely z, is missing, right? So really, in 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 three dimensions, this equation is is the same as this equation, right? x squared plus y squared, but the z term is missing. So that means it has a coefficient of zero, right? Uh, Okay. And so you're wondering, well, if I graph this equation in dimensions as opposed to two dimensions, what sort of thing get sort of true? Okay. When you graph uh, these uh, equations in three variables, x, y, and z, in three dimensions, you get surfaces. Okay. Right. You don't get curves, but you get surfaces. So if you graph this equation in dimensions, when you get some sort of surface, all you're trying to do is anticipate kind of as best you can in your mind, which is not easy to do. What is this surface going to be? So that if I do say try to graph it with software, what I expect to see? Sort of. Right. So that's the first time I'm going to think about is these equations that are called cylinders. You'll see why this is called a cylinder. This is a good example, right? Uh, but a cylinder is an equation in variables where one of the variables is missing. So what you really have is like two variables. Uh, bracket, right? Right now, look. Um, so let's think about what's going on. Uh, graphing this, um, thinking, graphing this equation. Notice the z doesn't go really into. Uh, uh, the solutions to this equation, right? Really, as long as you have the x and the y, right, to solve the equation, choice of z here is true. Um, now, let's think about what would be the x, y trace of this. So, in other words, if you just plot the piece of this surface that intersects with x, y axis, that's called the x, y trace. So, Whatever this big surface looks like in three dimensions, where does it intersect? X axis. When it intersects with the x axis, what sort of curve? Because in two dimensions, you're going to get a curve, right? So, what sort of curve do you get in the xy plane in two dimensions for this surface intersects with? Of course, let's see. In the xy plane, what is the value of zero? Uh, what is the value of c? So when you're sitting flat on the xy plane, how you can see it. See right. So you're sort of thinking of, um, uh, uh, I'm going to uh, find the solutions to this equation where z is equal to zero. Of course, it would matter. Zero. Three months. Okay? Um, that's the same solution. That's it. This term is similar. But nevertheless, all right? Let's think of the solutions to this equation. Is zero. Does the graph look like the x y? Well, in the x y plane, then just thinking of graphing this equation, right? X squared plus y squared equals nine. But that equation, plot that equation in the x y plane, sort of tricky. I remember circle. That's a circle, right? Exactly. Oh, that's perfect. Um, uh, 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 what um, what do you know about that circle, by the way? The radius is three, right? And the center is what? Zero, right? If you write this in, I uh, forgot what form this is called. Center radius form, right? Um, 
if you write this equation like this, uh, you can see that uh, uh, the center of this circle is zero, zero. So it has center at the origin and the radius is uh, three. Remember, you may recall from your pre-calculus days, or you wrote that down wrong, or your algebra training, that if you have an equation in two variables, like this, then the solutions to that equation, when you graph them, will give you a circle where the center is at h comma k and the radius is r, okay? Well, so we have a center at zero, zero, and our radius is three. All right, so let's plot that in three dimensions now. So there's the graph in three dimensions. Now, this is not the graph of the entire surface, okay? This is just the part where the surface intersects the x, y plane. In other words, it's equal to this circle. Um, from the triangle, uh, triangle to the x. So, get a circle. Its center is at 10, and the radius there is 5. This gives us a strong gives us a strong to what the whole surface is like. Okay. So thank you about the surface. Look, um, so this point, right, is on our surface, right? Because it's on this curve it's on the part of the surface that intersects it's fine. But remember in the equation x squared plus y squared not uh, the, uh, or x squared plus y squared plus zero z. Remember, the z didn't contribute anything to the solutions of the equation. Right? So what that means is that um, you can have any point uh, with these same same two first coordinates, right? Will be on this plane. I'm uh, sorry. Will be on this surface. It doesn't matter what. Z coordinates. And Z coordinates any because we're going to find this x squared squared plus Z is fully. So the Z can be 100 or minus 100, right? And that point will still be solutions to that equation. So what that tells you is that any vertical line that runs through this point, because the Z coordinates, it can be anything, any vertical line that runs through this point is going to be a solution to that equation. It's going to be a And in fact, um, that works for any point on this curve. So if you were to take, say, this point, what are the coordinates of that point? Um, X is 3, 3, 0, 0, right? Okay. Of course, three squared plus zero squared plus ah, okay, okay. So, that, so this point, a uh, uh, three zero zero is on the curve and therefore the surface. But the z coordinate, you can add any z coordinate, right? And you would also get a uh, surface. So notice this surface will contain any vertical line that goes through this point, okay? So any vertical line that goes to this point, well, in fact, any line that goes through any point on this circle, any of the points on that one also a solution to Z coordinate this doesn't make any difference. Let's draw a picture of that um, just to illustrate that a little better, what I was kind of pointing at. Here's what I was trying to say, you see, okay? Any line that goes through this point any bird line that goes to this point, right, on wrap of this equation. Because the z coordinate doesn't make any difference to me. But, but look, again, you can do this for any point. Uh, do this for any on the uh, uh, surface. So if you do that for any point on the surface and draw that picture, what is that going to look like? 
what's that surface going to end up looking like? I think it's going to end up like this, isn't it? Can y'all see that? Okay. Trying to get this sort of picture, right? You take any line, right? To turn x y plane, okay? That plane be on that surface. So, well, wow, what do you get here? So, get a cylinder, right? So, okay. What you've got there is a uh, two factor cylinder. Um, this uh, uh, this curve in the x y plane, by the way, now, that's called the generating curve. Right? This cylinder, okay? because really the whole cylinder is just what copies of this circle, right? Okay, that we've translated up and that we've translated up and down the entire surface. So this is called the generating curve the surface. These uh, these uh, uh, perpendicular lines here. That we drew through the generating curve, those are called movings for the surface. Okay, so the surface just consists of these perpendicular lines through the generating curve, and the generating curve or entire surface. So any surface you create this way is called a cylinder, but they don't all look like this. All right, okay? but the surface is still referred to as a a cylinder. So, uh, so let's remind ourselves. How do we get a cylinder? We have an equation in three variables, but what's missing? One of the variables, right? Okay. But it does not have to be C, right? One of the variables missing. It does not have to be C. Now, so to to graph an equation like this, or to try to think of graphing an equation like this, do of course, plot the trace of the equation in the plane defined by the missing variable. That makes sense that I say that right? So, what did we do? We had x squared plus y squared equals 9. Z was missing, so that means we graphed the, uh, 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 the equation in. The plane defined by the missing variable z was missing, so that means the plane that we wanted to graph our uh, uh, equation in is the x y plane because z is missing. So try to graph the curve in the, in this case the x y plane, and then draw perpendicular lines through that curve. Any perpendicular lines as you can through that curve. That will generate the entire surface. Such a surface is called a cylinder. Any of the surfaces we work with, in fact, you'll see will be cylinders because you'll have an equation where one of the variables is missing. All right, let's take a look at an example. See if we can figure it out. Oh, here's an example of a cylinder, by the way. Okay, this one is not. Your regular cylinder. See the generating curve here. This picture is not in the x y plane. Generating curve is in the x z plane. The x z plane is upright. The x z plane is again, it's the plane that the x axis and the z axis. I have a curve there. I don't know what sort of formula, but that curve is right. So it's like kind of a curve in the x z plane. And then uh, draw perpendicular lines to that. And if draw all of those lines, you see it's nice. Maybe surface. That's still, still. By the way, what variable is missing? I don't know if the equation for that cylinder is. What variable is missing for that equation? Not right. Yeah, bias. Make up a Again, curve, okay, curve. Just think of that as a three-dimensional equation. So, yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah, I can think. Yeah, yeah. You can have any sort of an equation in two variables if you want. Yeah. So you could have created this one. You know, with uh, um, what is that cubic maybe or something. Right, okay. Well, let's take one and, um, all right, so, so almost, 
uh, cubic, but not quite, all right? So here we have z equals y squared, okay? So we're just trying to predict now what this thing is going to look like. We're just trying to imagine it because we're not going to try to graph it. Still going to be challenging to graph, okay? Not impossible, but still kind of challenging to graph this one. So one of the variables is missing, right? Obviously x. So that means then that the generating curve for this cylinder, this is a cylinder, falls in what plane? The yz plane, right. And here is the uh, here is the generating curve in yz plane. What sort of thing is that? If you graph that in two dimensions in the yz plane, what sort of curve do you get? So if you just sort of ignore the fact that you were in three dimensions, sort of imply graph this sort of sort of. Sort of that's a parabola, right? Yeah, it's a parabola. Okay. It's a parabola that opens up somehow, right? Okay. So you're going to get a parabola. All right. But then to form the entire surface, you will take again these uh, so called rulings, right? You'll take these perpendicular, you'll take these lines perpendicular to that parabola, extend those infinitely along the x axis, right? Along the x axis. And that would form the entire surface. So what's that thing going to look like? You take a parabola. Do that with a parabola. Then you think of drawing lines through the parabola, right? Infinitely to the front and the back. What sort of what sort of surface do you that, does that look like? What? Yeah, horseshoe, right? But it's not flat, right? Okay, because it's a surface in three dimensions. So, itch or something, right? Okay. What's the right word for such a thing? A trough? Let's see if we can see it. Oh, here it is, all right? All right, it's going to look like this. Does that make sense? Now, see that very well? Got to get a trough. Two sides. Right. So the generating curve is in the yz plane, right? There's the yz plane upright like this, right? And in the yz plane, that is a parabola. It's a very standard looking parabola. I actually think that parabola is graphed here. It's hard to see it. That parabola is actually graphed here. I think it's this. I looked at this right i think it's this curve right here there is the generating curve can y'all see that i should have drawn that in a different color there's the generating curve for that trough right okay it is right there it's that parabola in the yz plane and then the rulings, right, those are the perpendicular lines. They're going to go front to back here, right, uh, 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 perpendicular to the YZ plane, right, through that uh, generator. So you get this trough-shaped sort of stuff down. Okay, cool. See, not, not that terribly to understand that sort of stuff, right? All right, what about this one? So this is kind of to your point, Elijah. What can the curve be? The curve can be anything, right? So um, what does this thing go? Like? So what's our what's our generating curve here? Where is it? Yeah, it's a sine wave, right? So the generating curve is in what? The XZ plane? So the, in this picture, 
Ooh, it's going to be hard to graph this one, right? Because the XZ plane is upright from front to back, right? So it's even kind of hard to imagine the XZ plane in this picture. But the generating curve is in the XZ plane. And the generating curve is, um, if we rewrite it, what? Z is equal to sine of X. So just a sine curve, right? Okay. So just graph a sine curve there, right? It's going to be undulating above and below the x-axis, right? Okay. But in the z in the xz plane. Does that look like that could be right? So I think the generating curve looks something like this. Black line probably didn't cut. So you get a sine curve in. X, Z, then draw these uh, perpendicular lines, but particular to the XZ plane or parallel to the Y axis that run this generator. So you get this very nice wavy uh, surface, right? So you get a sine surface. So sine. Since this uh, uh, surface is going above and below the x axis, it's hard to see it. So, another example. Okay, so. I see just being almost impossible. <laughs> so, I'm going to use a machine to wrap that up perfectly. Uh, but, um, of course, when you think the graph, you understand. Now, what I was expecting to see, you don't understand it properly. So, okay, well, of course, now, uh, uh, equations, in, <laughs> all right, so, you know, <laughs> equations in three variables that are missing one variable, we've kind of simplified the situation, right? But most often, of course, when we're graphing equations in three variables, x, y, and z, all variables are going to be, right? So we're not going to have something as simple as a um, a cylinder uh, to deal with, okay? Um, so, so let's talk about other types of surfaces. And one familiar type that comes up frequently as examples are going to be what are called quadratic surfaces. And so these are two dimensional, I'm sorry, second degree equations in three dimensions. That gives you what's known as a quadratic surface. So when I say second degree, that means all the terms have to be at most degree two, right? But you've got three variables. So if you write down in general what an equation like this can look like, you get a mess. Because there are lots of possibilities for second degree terms in three variables. Here they are. Right? You can have x squared, obviously, that's second degree, right? You can have y squared, you can have c squared. So you may have these terms in your uh, quadratic surface equation. But you can also get second degree by multiplying the variables to the first power together. So x times y is a second degree term. Because it's x to the first power times y to the first power, one plus one is two. This is also two. So you have to look at every possible combination. So you have x times y, x times z, and y times z. These terms may also be quadratic circle. And then, of course, you can have first power terms. So you can have just a regular x, y, z term. And then you can just have a constant. So notice you have lots of possible Second equation. How many? Six, nine, ten. I mean, you have in simplified form, you can have. All right, so you can have kind of messy uh, 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 second degree equations. Uh, but nevertheless, when you graph a second degree equation, two variables, you're going to get a surface like one of the following. Okay, so here is the things that you can get from a second degree equation. And we're just going to 
practice a little bit with trying to recognize what sort of surface we're going to get from a particular equation, but we're not going to try to usually by hand, well, never, I don't think, try to actually back. Right? But you want to imagine this is possible. Uh, now, um, when I wrote down, uh, uh, I, I, I wrote down that uh, second degree of quadratic equation variable. I wrote it down where it's simplified. Okay? Um, in, this, in this sort of catalog of surfaces, though, they don't have the equation simplified in uh, different okay? um, right, So uh, if you have an equation that looks like this, okay, where you have x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1, graph this creature, and we get uh, what's called an elliptical. So you get kind of a sphere. How do they call it? You get kind of a sphere, but it's not quite a sphere. Um, the uh, if you look at uh, 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 um, traces there of the sphere, you get ellipses instead of circles. So it's kind of it's a sphere. So but that's why they call it. Notice the form of the equation, though, right? Got your three unknown squares. Uh, all added together, that's kind of yeah. um, so to decide if you've got to do it. Right. Ah, let's see what else we can get. So you can get these other surfaces called hyperboloids. They kind of look like cylinders, right? But um, but not quite because they're not of a constant uh, width. There, there are two types of these hyperboloids. Uh, this is called a hyperboloid of one sheet, but sometimes the hyperboloids are separated, so you get two separate sections to the hyperboloid. This is called a hyperboloid of two sheets. Uh, Y'all see the form of the equation, though. However, okay. Um, what's different about that uh, uh, quadratic equation from see what changed there? It looks very similar, right? But it's not. <laughs> yeah, one of the terms is negative, right? Okay, so uh, uh, if you switch to one of the terms being negative, right, move from elliptical cone to instead a hyperboloid. Now, um, uh, hyperboloids there have what are called axes of symmetry. So the axis is that um, that line that's running directly in the middle of the hyperboloid, right? Okay. And notice you have a little there that says the axis of the hyperboloid will correspond to the variable that's coefficient is negative. So you see in this equation, since the, uh, that Z term is negative, Know that the axes of the hyperbola so is parallel to the same axis. Okay. So this hyperbola is up and down. So, um, what about a hyperbola with two different sections to it? So the two sections don't quite come together. What kind of distinguishes that equation? See? Yeah, yeah, two. By the way, notice the equations are set equal to one, right? So pay attention to that. that makes sense. Uh, here it says the axis of the hyperbola corresponds to the variable whose coefficient is positive. Oh, so uh, z is positive. And so notice that axis is So you get these hyperboloids. Even hard to say, right? Hope I'm saying it right. Then this is also kind of a hyperboloid, but it, uh, but the uh, top and bottom are cones instead of being uh, these curve shapes, right? Um, oh, what's that? 
So you have one of the terms is negative, but what distinguishes that from um, equal zero? zero. So, so that's kind of like a hard, like you've got the two pieces uh, on the top and the bottom, but those are those turn out to both uh, homes, okay? So, uh, Okay, you can also get things that look like parabolas. So these are called parabolas. Notice this one, it looks like a parabola that's just been rotated around the z-axis. Okay. And um, so these have very nice equations, though, because notice one of the unknowns is just raised to the power. Just that z squared plus. Sorry, uh, x squared over a plus y squared over x squared over x squared over x squared. Y squared, over x squared, over x squared. But you could have x equals the um, y squared plus c squared and have y equals for c squared. So that's c. Uh, but you do know that, again, the axis of the paraboloid, the line that we're trying to the paraboloid, that is going to correspond to the variable that's raised to the first power. So in a paraboloid, you always have a variable raised to the first power. In this case, it's z. Notice the axis of that paraboloid, right, is Z axis. This figure also called a paraboloid. It's also called a saddle. That looks like a saddle. And um, but what's the difference between the first paraboloid and this one? What is these paraboloids? Uh, so counter and zero still balance. Yeah, negative coefficient. So that these terms add to the term subtracted. Still though the axis of this paraboloid would be on the Z axis here. So that's the it's raised. That's it's raised. Is that it? Is there another type? Seems like we've forgotten something. Oh no, that's it. So there's our working catalog there of so-called quadratic surfaces. That's not too bad, okay? So see, you already know, that's kind of good, right? You already know um, if, you gra uh, if you graph a second degree equation in three variables like this one, you're going to get a picture like this and um, maybe be able to figure out what the picture is going to look like. Let's try it here. I'm wondering if we can do it. So, so this says sketch the surface. We're not going to try to sketch the surface, but let's see if we can try to figure out what sort of surface we're going to get. And then we'll look at a sketch here and see if it can get right. Okay. So see, this is second degree, right? And all three of the unknowns are all three of the unknowns there are there, unfortunately, right? So we don't have a cylinder, right? So we can't treat it like a cylinder. So this this has to be a quadratic surface, right? Could it be a paraboloid or an elliptic cone or a hyperboloid of some type, right? Okay, one of those sort of shapes. But first, let's see if we can massage it into the form that was in the uh, table. Okay, and remember in the table you had. Uh, you normally just had x squareds and y squareds and z squareds, right? You didn't have the coefficients, right? And often on the left hand side of the equation, uh, you have one or uh, uh, zero, uh, but uh, didn't have the constant 12. So, let's see if we can get rid of, if we can get rid of some things here, or, or re not really get rid of some things, but let's see if we can rewrite this in a form that looks like what's in the table. Um, all right, so here's what I would do first. Oh, well, are y'all saying what? Y'all telling me what to do? Any ideas there? The 12 is what's bothering me, so I have to somehow adjust the 12. What? Yeah, put it equal minus 12, and then I want this to be a 1, because a lot of those equations had 1s in them, right? Not minus 12. So 
Uh, I can make that a one just by dividing everything by minus 12. Is that correct? And um, let's see what happens when we do that. We get, ooh, what do we get here? This becomes minus x squared over 3. Is that right? And th But this becomes plus y squared over 4. And then this becomes minus, what, um, uh, z squared, which I can write that as z squared over 1 if I want to. So I have like this. And now let's put the, let's put the positive term first. So I have y squared over 4 minus x squared over 3 minus z squared over 1, or just z squared is equal to 1. Oh. Right, that's looking maybe a lot more like something I can understand. Does that fit into one of those? Uh, does that fit into one of those categories? It's not a paraboloid, right? Because all the variables are raised to the second power. So, is it some sort of elliptical cone? Is it this one? No, that's got zero, right? So, not that one. Let's go up. Is it this one? Whoops, that one looks like it, doesn't it? Ah, so it looks like we have a hyperboloid there, right? Okay. We have one positive, right? And then the two negative terms, the unknown squared equal. Okay. So you have a hyperboloid, and it looks like a hyperboloid of two sheets. Um, is that hyperboloid going to be opening up and down, or is it going to be opening left and right, or front and back? How do we know? But the positive coefficient, that's right. Okay. So the axis of the hyperbola, right, it, it tells you the uh, how the axis of symmetry for the hyperbola is directed by right, how it runs. So in this case, what was our uh, what was our positive variable here? Was it y? So that means the axis of symmetry is parallel to the y-axis, right? So the axis of symmetry is parallel to the y-axis. So depending on how we're drawing the y-axis, usually we draw that front to back. So this hyperboloid has two sheets, but the two sheets are opening front to back, not up and down, right? Um, and that's really kind of what we're aiming for is sort of that understanding. And then we would use a computer to help us make the graph. Let me look at the graph here. There it is. Well, in this case, I I didn't <laughs> I didn't draw the y-axis from front to back. I have from left to right. There it is. Okay. So um, I said it wrong. So there it is. There's the y-axis. There's our two. Color. So we. Well, we understood kind of what that surface was. Like. Now, particulars of the surface, like water intercepts and things like that, usually not going to so much concentrate. Okay, it's not initially true. These uh, these uh, contours here, these traces, are much things in two dimensions. Those circles. Sure. Sure. Oh, I um, all right, let's try this one now. Okay. So let's see if we can figure out what that thing looks like. So this has got a variable to the first power. So you're going to solve certainly for that variable, right? So you get, um, uh, you get their X is equal to, uh, y squared plus what? 4z squared, is that right? And um, I don't like having the coefficient of 4. I cannot divide everything by 4, though, because I do like having x equals, all right? Because that looks like, uh, 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 that looks like uh, what, the, uh, what we have in the catalog, right? In fact, what 
uh, 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 what surface matches kind of this equation in our catalog here. Is it this one? Is this an elliptical paraboloid? It's almost hard, really hard to learn the names, right? Yeah, I think that is an elliptical paraboloid, except the axis of symmetry there is parallel to the x-axis, right? Because it's x that's raised to the, we have x that's raised to the first power. So we're going to get a, a one of these bowl-shaped creatures when we graph this, but the bowl is going to be opening uh, along the, uh, uh, parallel to the x-axis, right? Uh, but, uh, but notice that in this equation, we have y squared divided by something. We don't have a coefficient on the y squared, or in this case, a coefficient on the z squared. So can you get, can you see how to massage this? So how to rewrite this equation? So they don't have a four here. Multiplying by four is the same as dividing by what? One fourth, right. So you can write this as, y squared over 1 plus z squared over 1 fourth. So give it there a denominator of 1. Well, that doesn't really change our mind, though, about what the original thing is going to look like. Right? So we're going to get one of these uh, paraboloids, and it's going to be opening somehow along the x-axis. So let's see what the picture looks like here. Did we say that right? There it is. Oh, okay. So nice. So it opens there on the positive side of the x-axis. Um, these um, traces, so this curve around the outside of the paraboloid, that is not a circle. That's an ellipse. See it kind of really in this picture. So this is not a circle. This is this. Oh, okay, so here's the error. All right. so this is, uh, obviously this is this is second degree, right? Okay. Uh, 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 you know, you've got the variables raised to the second power, so you're going to get a quadratic surface when you graph this one. Um, but this one has been translated. Okay. So this one is not centered at the origin. It's been shifted. But we're going to figure, I think we can figure out how it's been shifted. But we have to do a little bit of uh, algebra. Okay. Um, so you might recall uh, doing things like this in two dimensions. We're going to try doing it now in three dimensions. You see what I'm going to do here is I'm going to write the x terms together. So I'm going to write x squared minus 4x plus... And let me see if I'm doing this right. 2y squared um, plus 4y, okay? And then um, plus uh, z squared minus 2z. And then I'm going to put the 3 on this side, okay? So that becomes minus 3. Did I write that down right? I don't know. <laughs> right. I write it in the terms of it. So... Yeah, so far, so good. Now, what I'm going to do here is complete the square on the x terms and y terms. Remember, completing the square, I want to write that now as a square. So I want to write a factor together with the fact x squared minus 4 it says a perfect square. That's not a perfect square, so you have to add something in to make it a perfect square. You know how to make that a perfect square? x squared minus 4x plus what would give me a perfect square? Plus 4, yeah. Take the, this coefficient, divide by 2 and square it. So you would have minus 4 divided by 2 squared gives you uh, exactly. Robert. So now this factors as x minus 2 squared. Okay. Um, here, before I try to complete the square, let's factor out a 2. So you have 2 times y squared plus 2y, and then we'll complete the square on the y squared plus 2y. Oh, I forgot to do something here, though. Um, I added 4 on this side, right? So you've got to keep the equation balanced. 
So I've got to add four on this side as well. Well, uh, so how can I complete the square on y squared plus 2y? I'm going to erase a little bit of this. How can I complete, complete the square on y squared plus 2y? So what can you add here so that you can factor y squared plus 2y as a perfect square? Take the 2, divide it by 2, and square it. What's 2 divided by 2 squared? Is that 1? So put a 1 here. Make sure, though, that you factor out the two first from these two um, coefficients, because you need to have this as a y squared before you square. All right. And, um, well, how does y squared plus uh, 2y plus 1 factor? That factors as y plus 1 squared, right? Nice. Ah, but, <laughs> again, now I have to keep the equation balanced. So what did I add to this side? 1. But the one is in parentheses, so it was really what? Two. So put a two out here. Keep the equation balanced. How do you complete the square here? What would you add in there? A one again? Yeah. Because if you take the minus two, Divide that by 2 and square it, you still get positive 1. So here I'm going to add in 1. So let's make sure we add it on this side as well. And now this factors as z minus 1 squared is equal to, what's the grand total here on the right-hand side? 4? How nice there. Now divide everything by 4. So you get um, x minus 2 squared over 4 plus y plus 1 squared 2 plus z minus 1 squared or is equal to 1. What does that look like? So what surface does that correspond to? Is that the very first one? Yeah, I think it is. Isn't that an elliptical cone? Because you've got x squared, y squared, z squared, divided by some numbers here, right? Divided by some constants there equal to one. That's exactly what we've got in this equation, except we don't have quite x squared, y squared, z squared. We have x with this constant squared, y with this constant squared, z with this constant squared. So what is that telling us? We do have an elliptical cone, but what have we done with it? We've shifted its center to what? Yeah, there you go. You It's just like shifting the center of a circle. You've shifted the center here to 2 minus 1, 1. Okay. So you're going to get one of these it's really a sphere, but it's a sphere that uh, is, uh, that is uh, uh, you know, been distorted, right? It's not quite a perfect sphere. That's called an elliptical cone. Let's see what the picture looks like. So there it is, okay? There's our... So you see these cross sections, right, are non-circles. This was a sphere. This cross section like this would be, uh, be a um, circle. It's actually an ellipse, okay? So you have a sphere that's been stored. I look like the center's in the right place. Well, where would the center? Two, negative one. Yeah, that one. Somewhere that probably is the center. It's like two miles. There's a so here's your here's your exploration of, of services. But now uh, uh, here's what's going to happen though. Okay, um, 
most of the most of the equations that we'll be dealing with in the class will have this form. So there'll be z equal to, and then some expression uh, in x and y. So normally you we won't be working with. Um, for the most part, with uh, quadratic surfaces, okay, because we'll have to be able to see just raised to the first column. So that could be, I guess, one one type of quadratic surface, right? but we usually won't be encountering on frequently all of these different types of all of these different types of uh, uh, all of these different types of surfaces. Okay, wow, we're just right out of time. Been a time to better, but we didn't get to do any seat work today. That's unfortunate, but um, so we'll try to make up for that next time. Let's see what uh, what activities we have in the next notes. Okay. So our goal here to give you a preview of what's coming up. As you know, when we have a surface like this. Um, calculus, right? So, but it, it, it's a random surface like this, and we're given it on the surface. Well, we put it like at that into surface. So, it's just moving into the dimensions of your use of the two dimensions, right? Two dimensions have a curve, look for the tangent line. In three dimensions, we have a surface, one find the tangent surface. I'm sorry, the tangent plane. Um, okay, all right, so let's stop there. I think the tape today is going to be terrible because I stepped away from the microphone the whole time. So, um, well, it is what it is, all right? And uh, everyone got their test, right? Did I pass out the roll sheet? So is that out there? Okay, all right, so I'll see you guys on Wednesday then. All right, so don't forget there's one homework due uh, tonight, right?